Welcome to PM Ready, your guide to becoming PMP certified. This is the lesson on planning resource management, part one. There are two project management processes that are in the planning process group and the resource management knowledge area. These are plan resource management, which has as its primary outputs the resource management plan as well as the team charter, and the estimate activity resources process, which has as its main outputs the resource requirements, the basis of estimates that is a companion to and supports the resource requirements, as well as the resource breakdown structure. Resource management includes management of both physical resources and team members. However, the skills and competencies needed to manage these two types of resources are somewhat different. Managing physical resources involves identifying, allocating, and managing the use of things like equipment, materials, facilities, and infrastructure. You need to ensure that you have the right type of equipment that materials are of the required grade to meet quality requirements, and that you maintain an appropriate level of inventory of such items. Not too much inventory and not too little. Managing team members requires the project manager to both lead and manage the project team. The project manager is responsible for ensuring the team's effectiveness, and this begins with the identification of the skills and competencies needed, acquiring the right team members, and providing them with the environment and tools, and training, and support that they need to be effective. As you develop your project's resource management plan, you should analyze the factors that can affect the team and team performance. These factors include things like the team environment, the geographical locations of team members, communications among stakeholders, organizational change management, internal and external politics, cultural issues, and organizational uniqueness. What kind of environment will your team members be working in? If they work in an office, do they have separate offices, or are they in cubicles? Do they need to work for periods of time without distractions? If so, does their work environment support this? Cubicles, or even worse, an open space office environment, have been in fashion for years and are still popular in some organizations. However, these have been shown to reduce productivity for those who need to be able to work without distractions. Between the visual distractions of people walking by and the auditory distractions of so many people working in close quarters, open space offices and small cubicles create a real problem for knowledge workers who need to focus in order to be productive. Even with separate offices, meetings and phone calls and people stopping by with questions can significantly reduce a team's productivity. On the other hand, there are real advantages to closer collaboration not only between the business people and the project team, but also between the members of the team. Co-location, which is putting the team and key stakeholders in the same place, such as in offices or cubicles all in the same area, or in the same open office space, can greatly improve collaboration by making it so much easier to ask questions as they come up and to have impromptu discussions to resolve issues. Dealing with these things right away, rather than putting them off, can really help the productivity of a team. However, each of these goals competes with the other. The need for periods of time of focus without interruption on the one hand, and the need for greater collaboration on the other. How do you balance these competing needs? Some organizations balance them by reserving different times of the day for different types of activities. For example, reserving the morning hours for focused work 
and no one's allowed to interrupt anyone or to schedule any meetings in the mornings. Then the afternoons are available for meetings, questions, discussions, and so on. Other organizations provide places where people can go to be away from interruptions so they can focus on something for a few hours without being disturbed. Others swear by the advantages of having the team in a single large project room so that when a question is raised by one of the team members, all of the others can overhear the discussion and either participate if they can add value to the conversation or simply to learn what was decided and why. This can create a cohesive team in which everyone understands much better each other's work and how they can help each other. Each project is unique and each team is unique, so you'll have to figure out how best to balance these competing needs. The key is to be familiar with these different approaches and to determine, based on the people on your team and the organization and the culture that you operate in, which is the best way to set up your team's working environment. You should also be prepared to experiment with this and plan to monitor the effect of different factors and adjust as you go, adopting what works and changing or removing what doesn't. The geographical locations of team members can be a huge impediment. Occasionally, you'll need the participation of someone who simply can't be physically present with the rest of your team. So you'll have to decide on the technology and processes and guidelines for how best to work with remote team members. Teams in different time zones, especially if their working days don't overlap much, such as having one team in the United States and another in Australia or India, can be quite a challenge. People sometimes tout the idea that you can get work done much more quickly this way, because you can give work to a team on the other side of the world, and they can work on it and have it done for you by the next morning. However, this assumes that no collaboration or clarification is needed, which is only the case when the work to be done is easily defined or there are well-established processes for doing the work. With effort, this can work for certain types of operations, but it's not usually an advantage in and of itself for projects. This doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Effective and very beneficial partnerships can span the globe, and sometimes the challenges of distances between the teams is outweighed by the advantages that each partner brings to the partnership. However, geographical locations of team members is a significant factor that you, as the project manager, need to seriously address. Communication among stakeholders is important in some cases and undesirable in others. You will need to determine which types of communication with which stakeholders are beneficial and when and how those communications should take place. As much as communication is important, it needs to be managed and controlled to encourage the best communication and avoid distractions and interference. Organizational change management can affect your project team in a couple of ways. One is that your organization may be going through some changes and you'll need to learn how to operate your team within that environment. Another is that your project team may need for you to apply some organizational change management to deal with the changes that they'll be going through as you organize and put together this team into what may be a unique team environment and certainly with unique team members. You'll also want to proactively make the effort to understand and manage both internal and external politics that can affect your team and its effectiveness. In addition, different cultural issues can affect your team, especially if you're working on a project that interfaces with or partners with other teams in other locations around the globe. These cultural issues need to be understood and accounted for. You may need to provide some training for your team members 
to make sure that they are culturally sensitive to each other's needs across the globe. Even if you don't have significant cultural issues because of location, each organization is unique, and if you're working with different organizations, you need to take the time as a project manager to understand those differences so that you can inform your team and learn to work together better. If you haven't learned this yet, you'll need to learn that the project manager needs to be proactive in everything that they do. And resource management is no exception. The project manager needs to be proactive in developing the team skills and competencies that are needed for your team. You'll need to identify what those needed skills and competencies are, identify any gaps, and have a plan for providing the training or other mentoring that is needed to close those gaps. You'll also want to think ahead of time about efforts that you can make to retain and improve the team satisfaction and motivation on your team. It's best to consider these things in advance and have a plan for this so you can really start off on the right foot in organizing and establishing your team. You as the project manager will also need to take the lead in not only defining but in demonstrating professional and ethical behavior for all of your team members. At a minimum, you'll want to be familiar with and practice the PMI Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. This provides much guidance and information for you about appropriate professional and ethical behavior. The main outputs of your plan resource management process are the resource management plan and the team charter. The resource management plan determines the approach to ensure that sufficient resources are available. You'll need to especially consider competition for scarce resources. It will be especially important for you to work with your PMO, your project sponsor, your program, your portfolio, and even other project managers and functional managers to make sure that you're doing everything you can to acquire and have access to the scarce resources that you need. You should not assume that the resources you need will be available when you need them. And even once they've been reserved, you'll want to check periodically to make sure that they're still going to be available when you need them and for as long as you need them. Your team charter is where you will record the decisions you've made about team values, communication guidelines, decision making, how you will resolve conflicts, and your guidelines for holding effective meetings. The inputs to the plan resource management process start with the project charter, which may include some pre-identified resources, which you'll need to include in your resource management plan. Pre-identified resources may be identified as early as the project charter for projects in which you have a specific piece of equipment or certain personnel with specialized skills or unique experience that are critical to the success of your project. If these are identified early on in the project charter, you'll need to make sure you carry over this decision into your resource management plan. Your project charter can also include any pre-approved financial resources that can affect the amount of money that you have to plan for and acquire your resources, so that can affect your planning. Also, summary milestones that can affect when you need to have things done and which resources may be available to you in those time frames. And we'll also identify some key stakeholders that can affect your resource planning. Your requirements documentation and scope baseline, which includes your project scope statement, work breakdown structure, and WBS dictionary, include details of deliverables, work packages, activities, and requirements. Details that you need in order to determine what resources are needed, 
and how they'll need to be managed. Your quality management plan will include specific quality standards and quality activities that can affect your resources. Your project schedule provides you with the timeline, which will guide you for when your resources are needed. The stakeholder register can help you to identify stakeholders that can help you identify and acquire needed resources that you might not otherwise be able to get. The risk register is on the list because you'll always want to consider risks in how you do your planning, and resource planning is no exception. And of course, as always, you have the enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets as inputs. This list of enterprise environmental factors that can affect your plan resource management process should be rather familiar to you by now. You've seen these factors listed in many other planning processes. They include the organizational culture and structure, which can affect all sorts of planning processes, the geographic distribution of your facilities and resources, including team members, what existing resources and competencies and availability you have with these resources or of these resources, as well as your marketplace conditions, including things such as what resources are available on the marketplace for you to acquire temporarily or to partner with. If you're in an organization that is more of a traditional functional organization organized by departments, then as a project manager, unless you have a strong PMO in your organization, you're going to have some extra work to do in order to identify and acquire the resources you need because you don't have a lot of control and power in this type of an organization. This is just one example of how your organization's structure can influence your resource management plans. On the other hand, if you have more of a project-oriented environment, you may have a lot more control. Unless, of course, you have a project type of organization that is so flexible that people have the freedom to come and go from teams as they please. And that requires a very different approach to getting the resources you need and keeping them for the duration of the project. If, after looking at the resources that are available to you within your organization, you find that you don't have either the competencies needed or those resources are not available when you need them, then you'll need to start using some of the procurement processes and working with your procurement department to find those resources from outside your organization that can contribute to your project and see to its success. And there are quite a number of organizational process assets that will affect your resource management plan. These include your human resources policies and procedures. So you'll need to get with your HR department and make sure that you understand and are appropriately applying all of your organization's policies and procedures for how you can acquire people for your project team. This can help you to avoid some missteps in working with functional managers and others in your organization. There will also be physical resource management policies and procedures. You will want to get together with resource managers and facilities managers in order to make sure you understand these policies and procedures and that you're working with all of the right people in the right way. You'll definitely need to include consideration for the safety policies that need to be in place, as well as security. Security also applies to information. If you're working on an IT or software development project that involves sensitive information, there will be specific rules about how that information needs to be secured. Similarly, if you're working with high-value physical assets, you'll need to be aware of how those need to be secured during the course of your project. And not surprisingly, you should look to your organization for templates for your resource management plan, 
as well as consulting historical information for similar projects, which comes from your Lessons Learned repository, so that you can see how others have put together resource management plans for previous projects and how that can help you on yours. At the top of the list of tools and techniques, as usual, is expert judgment. This is especially important for those of us who started out in a more technical field and then moved into management later in our career. Managing resources requires a lot of soft skills. These can be learned over time, but it's especially useful to rely on experts that have a lot of these soft skills to help you ensure that you are planning on the proper use of these and that you take advantage of them as needed. Such soft skills include things like negotiation, talent management and development, the acquisition of resources, and vendor management. Another tool and technique is organizational theory, which is about how people and teams and organizational units behave. It's also about adapting your leadership style to your team's maturity level and how organizational culture can affect your project team. There's a lot to learn about organizational theory. It's very beneficial to make this a study and to apply this to your project management skills and competencies. And of course, you'll have plenty of meetings to discuss resource management with key stakeholders. Also under the category of tools and techniques are a few data representation techniques. We've covered these in a previous lesson about the documents related to resource management, but to quickly review them here, the work breakdown structure should be used as the framework for you to make sure that every work package and every activity has someone assigned to it. The organizational breakdown structure is that structure in which you've taken the work breakdown structure and all of its contents and reorganized it so that it matches your organization's org chart so that anyone in the organization can look at their department or division, if you will, and see all of those work packages and activities that they're responsible for. Then there's the resource breakdown structure, which identifies and categorizes the resources that you need and puts those into a hierarchy. And at the very bottom of this hierarchy, you, you continue breaking this down until you have a level of detail at the bottom that is sufficient for you to be able to connect this to your work breakdown structure and to coordinate your resource needs with your work packages. Another valuable technique to use in your resource management is the responsibility assignment matrix. And here you have an example of one type of responsibility assignment matrix, which is called the RACI chart. RACI, R-A-C-I, stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. In a chart like this, you identify the different activities or responsibilities along the side here. So you've got one row for each one of these. And then in the different columns, you list the different people that are going to be working on your project and responsible for different parts of it. Someone who's marked as responsible is someone who will be working on this task. So if you take a look at the first row, Create Charter, it shows that Ben is responsible. So that means Ben is the one who is going to create the charter. Then you have A for accountable. And that's listed under Anne. And that means that Anne is the person who needs to make sure that this gets done. You normally, in, in most circumstances, say that Anne is the responsible party. But in this case, we're being a little bit more precise and saying that people who are working on it are responsible, but the people who are ultimately 
accountable for getting it done to seeing that it gets done, that's listed as accountable. Then you have consult and inform. If someone is marked as consulted, that means you need to meet with them and get information from them. Inform means that when you're done with the charter, you share it with them, that you inform them of this. You can have multiple people responsible for something, such as submit change request. In this example, you can see both Carlos and Dinah are responsible, which means that both of them will be working on it. Ben's accountable for it, so Ben's the one who needs to make sure it gets done. And you have Ed, will, who will be consulted on it, and Anne, who will be informed. So this is an example in which you see two people working on it, or two people responsible. And of course, you can have multiple people consulted on any one activity, and multiple people informed. A racy chart like this is a simple but valuable tool in making sure that everyone understands their roles and responsibilities for completing different work packages or activities. Not all of the details that you'll need for different responsibilities and roles in the project can fit into a simple responsibility assignment matrix or a RACI chart. You'll typically need to have job descriptions and other position and role descriptions described in some detail in different text-oriented formats, such as job descriptions and role descriptions, that will give people a clear understanding of what their role and authority is on your project and how they interact and interface with others on the project team and others in the organization and even with outside vendors. These documents can also include descriptions of the competencies and qualifications required for each role. Each role should have a clearly defined not only responsibility, but appropriate level of authority to go with that responsibility so that each person has the level of, of authority needed to fulfill their responsibilities. And that's it for part one. PM Ready is a publication of PM Guaranteed and is based on the Project Management Institute's PMBOK Guide.